everybody who is joining me today. I am the Reverend Dr. Mary E. Biedren, and I am the Senior Minister of North Congregational Church in Farmington Hills, Michigan. This is Wednesday Inspiration for Wednesday, January the 20th, 2021. It's a cold day in Michigan. It's a day when we have been thinking about the inauguration. We've been thinking about the many ways that we're in ministry to the world. Uh, before coming back for this, I helped to load a whole collection of donated goods that are going down to Crossroads of Michigan to warm the hands and the heads and the hearts of the people who are clients of that soup kitchen and also social program. And there are many other things that we do as a church besides just our Sunday at 10.30 a.m. and our Wednesday at 3 o'clock p.m. worship times. So I invite you to look at the website, YouTube channel, or Instagram accounts that are being highlighted up on the screen at this moment and take a look at the things we do and some of the ways that you might consider joining in and participating on the various things we do. And if you are a North Church person, remember you can send me pictures of activities, of events, of things like that that involve the life of our church and our missions, and I'll be happy to include them on the Instagram account. During this period of time, this, this month of January, before we lead up to Lent, we're in the season of Epiphany. So it's not just the day when the wise men arrive, but it's also a brief season between the end of Christmas and Lent that helps us to think about the many ways that God comes to us in moments of sudden realization, in moments where we suddenly see a deeper meaning in something that we've seen many times before, an opportunity to change the way we think about things, an opportunity to do differently. On Sunday, we heard how Jesus came back from being out in the wilderness tempted by the devil after he had been baptized by John and read from the scroll of Isaiah about how the Spirit of God was upon him. And we talked about how he was offering both the people of his own hometown of Nazareth and us an opportunity for an epiphany, for a realization of how we could be involved in this whole long story of what God is doing in the world. <clears throat> And that story has an interesting conclusion, and I didn't want to miss the chance to share it and thought this Wednesday might be a perfect time to look at exactly how it is that God reaches out to us and sometimes how we respond. And so I'm going to continue the reading, Luke chapter 4, verses 22 through 30. All spoke well of Jesus and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth in the synagogue. They said, is this not Joseph's son? Jesus said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here in your hometown the things that we heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so that they might throw him off a cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. And so you wonder what kind of blessing God might add to this reading of his word. This story could be called A Visit Gone Terribly Wrong. Hometown boy made good comes back and does badly. What the heck happened here? How did they go from being so impressed to wanting to throw him off a cliff? And what does it mean for us? Why did three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, choose to include this story about Jesus getting no respect in his hometown? does it say for us? This is the occasion of Jesus' homecoming to Nazareth. He's been gone for a while. He grew up there after he and his parents went back there from Egypt. And then, at the age of 33, he began to embark upon his ministry. He went down to the Jordan River for John to baptize him. And then, as we are told, the Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness for 40 days when he neither ate nor drank and was tempted by the devil. He was tested before he went into his ministry on earth. Now, 
he came back after that time. You can just imagine, he must have looked fairly bedraggled. He had been out in the wilderness. He had had a really harrowing experience, a genuinely harrowing experience. And he came to the synagogue and stepped forward to read from the scroll. Now, I know how we all feel when our young people come back, when we see them as lay readers on these broadcasts, when we hear them to present in church, when we saw many of our teenagers on Christmas Eve reading the scriptures. It is a good feeling. The people in Nazareth, I think we're ready for a good feeling too. Oh, look, it's Jesus. He's back and he's going to read to us. They knew this as Isaiah prophecy. Those Torah scrolls were read all the way through in sequence every single year in the synagogue. But they may not have really understand the ways in which that synagogue, or that prophecy rather, was for them too. And so Jesus gets up and reads to them, The Spirit is upon, of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus sat down to teach. And Luke says, all eyes were upon him, wondering what he would say next. And what he said next was, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Everyone was very pleased about this. They spoke, well, isn't this Joseph's son? Didn't he do a good job? And then the conversation took a little turn. We hear he does miracles. Maybe he'll show some of those to us too, for old time's sake. Because, of course, we're his hometown. We are special to him. We are faithful. Aren't we right here in the synagogue? Aren't we ready to hear what he has to teach us? But then, when Jesus elaborated, he had some things to say that were not feel-good things, that did not say to them, good job, people. How wonderful that you're in the synagogue. How great you're doing. We, like them, hear the good news. But, like them, we get confused about whether it is just for us to receive or is it obliging us to do something in the world. Jesus said to the people, you know, no prophet really gets respect in his hometown, probably because they know him too well. Isn't that Jesus? Don't we remember when he had that funny adventure down by the well? Don't you remember all the strange things he said when he was a boy and how Mary had to get after him sometimes? Sometimes hometown folks don't have any way to understand when somebody comes with new things from God because they are sure they already know everything that person has to say. That is what happened to the people of Nazareth. When Jesus got up and proclaimed the prophecy from Isaiah and even when he said, today this is fulfilled in your hearing, they felt like they were honored recipients. And then when Jesus went on to say to them, some things about himself and about history of the history of their faith, it sounded more and more like bad news. What Jesus had to say is the good news is for all people. And very often the good news is manifested first outside of all of the understood boundaries of faith, outside of the places where we expect it. And so the widow of Zarephath was the one who had the prophet come to her in the midst of a famine. And so also the um, good heavens, Naaman, Syrian. I had to go back and look to be sure I had the right name. Naaman the Syrian, not an Israelite at all, not a Jew, was cleansed by the prophet, was cleansed of his leprosy in order to prove God's power. No prophet can necessarily do all the miracles or should do them in the hometown. The good news, which comes for all people, is there for everyone who is open to it. It is not the special providence of certain people. It is not brought only to the elect. It is not brought only to those who deserve it. The coming kingdom will require faith to understand that everybody is invited into the kingdom of God and that everybody will be put to some kind of test just as Jesus has been put to the test. Now, Many of our tests are not going to be as difficult as going for 40 days without food and sit, living out in the wilderness and being tempted by the devil. But there are voices whispering in our ears, just as the devil whispered in Jesus's, and told them stories, told them stories about how special they were, about how special their people were, about how special and how much they deserved the blessings of God. There were voices that whispered to them, 
that there is a comfortable way to understand this, a way to make this spiritual, to understand what he's saying, not literally, but spiritually. There was a voice that whispered to them, you know who God is. You already have this image in mind. You can work with that. You don't need new information. That voice whispers to us too. It whispers to all people of faith in our weak moments and even in moments when we think we're strong. There are moments that suggest that we can just be everything we need to be without having to do anything and just let God do it and trust that somehow we are already special and elect. But the truth is that there are times that in order for everyone to have something, some of us may have to give up a few things. And that is hard to hear. Jesus said that the good news was brought to the poor. That was the main mission that he came with. It was brought not to the perfect or the deserving. It was not brought to the most faithful. The good news was brought to the last and the least and the outcast, the ones who had no story of their own self-sufficiency left. That's who it came for. So no wonder his hometown went after him. How dare he do miracles for the Gentiles and then tell them off? How dare he share this blessing that they thought he owed them so broadly? They were angry because they were afraid that if this blessing got shared so widely, there might be none left over for us. My friends, that is not how the good news is. The good news is not like slices out of a pie, I always say. It is like candles on a birthday cake. The more the more there are, instead of being diminished, the greater the light. And so Jesus came to bring a message of good news for us all. That message include the message of release to the captives, now, who's a captive? Who's a prisoner? Aren't they all just up in prison where they get what they deserved? Get what they deserved? Yes, people who are prisoners may be there, and they may be innocent, they may be guilty, they may be reformed, but there are other ways than that to be a captive, to be imprisoned. We can be imprisoned by the comfortable lie and by our accommodation to it instead of the uncomfortable truth, one we'd really rather not face. We can be enslaved to the demons that come to us in our own desert moments, the times maybe we're not 40, 40 days out in the desert, but when we feel dry, when we feel emptied out, these voices tempting us to think that we are better than other people, that we are more worthy, that somehow we are the only ones who deserve what God is bringing. We are also sometimes captives to other things like depression and addiction and despair. There is much of that right now as the pandemic rages, as we have trouble understanding how the future is going to take form because the present is just so challenging for us. And so do we admit that we're enthralled to these things? Can we find it in ourselves to say, oh, I know what, I am a captive God. I'm a captive of a lot of things and then finally admit them. Jesus also came to proclaim sight to the blind, sight and insight, sight that allows us to see the truth the truth of the things that hold us back from living the way that God intends for us to live. The truth about the things that we need to change so that we may live with generosity and forgiveness, with compassion and recognition that we are all so much more like one another than we are different, that we are all beloved by God, that we are all special in God's heart and God's eyes. Jesus came to proclaim a kingdom that was not what people wanted to hear about then and really in many ways also now. So the stopover in Nazareth ends really badly. They got very angry and sometimes we get angry too because it's not comfortable to have our faults pointed out instead of being praised for our excellence. We'd like to think that we get our faith right. We'd like to think that we can do what Jesus said. We'd like to think with all of this progress, we know so much more than them. Surely we can do better than them. But we have trouble too. If it is so hard to do a little thing like wear a mask to protect your neighbor, how much harder is it to follow Jesus down this path of setting free the captives and giving sight to the blind, sharing what we have and caring about everybody in the world? It is not always easy. It's not always comfortable. The people in Nazareth tried to run Jesus out of town. They tried to toss him off a cliff and do away with him. Sometimes we do that too, even though we might not see it that way. Sometimes when we are confronted with things we'd rather not think about or do, we say, off the cliff, Jesus, 
We will decide if we're going to be generous. We will determine the terms of salvation. We will create boundaries and barriers that will outline our faith and make us feel good about ourselves. The Bible says Jesus slipped through the crowd. He slipped through their self-deceptions and went on his way. So the inspirational part of this is to ask ourselves, how could this have gone? How could this have story have gone differently? If we went back and reimagined it for ourselves, with ourselves in that crowd, how could this have been instead of a time of expulsion of Jesus, a time of inclusion and listening and hearing? If they had asked for clarification, if they had expressed their doubts and fears, if they had been willing to engage Jesus and say, you know, sometimes this does not sound very good. Sometimes we don't want to do this, Jesus. Can you help us? How can we be, be better? How can we deal with this? How can you answer this? Could they have seen themselves as something other than victims of his words? Could they have said, wow, that's really wonderful that the widow in Zarephath and the leper in Syria were healed. How can healing come to us? How can healing come to all the world? And maybe the most important question is, can we ask Jesus to help to put aside our doubts? Can we admit to God the things we fear, the times that we feel ashamed of? Can we offer ourselves and then say, how can we do better? Show us the path. Give us the courage to walk that way. Right now, we need that courage. We are in the midst of challenging times. There's pandemic and political strife. We've gone through a long period where people have been boldly and sometimes violently claiming different truths, completely different truths. There have been times when we have all been scared. We're afraid of getting sick. We're afraid of the people we love getting sick. We're afraid of what will fall apart. We're afraid of what shape the future may have. And it would be easier to just not talk about these things. It'd be easier if we could ignore it. It would be easier to run the difficult prophetic voices out of town, off a cliff, away from us, and hope that maybe someone else will come and do the miracles we feel we deserve. Or maybe, just maybe, we're called to follow this difficult guy. We're called to be honest with him and admit that our way doesn't always work so well, but we don't know what else to do. It might be that we are called to let down the guardrails and the qualifications and begin to see ourselves and then everyone else as God's beloved children. I want to give the Lutheran preacher Nadia Boltz Weber, one whom I, I follow on the internet and admire very much, the last word for all of us because she puts the, the crisis and the promise of this passage so well. And so listen to what she says. The thing is, Jesus fought with the devil. He saw all the easy answers and false promises and BS for what it is. And the first thing that he says in the Gospel of Luke is that quotation from Isaiah and the first of his very own words in the whole Gospel of Luke that he utters is the word today. Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this moment. And so imagine our minds and our hearts and our eyes wide open. Imagine the brows becoming unfurrowed, the doubts seeming less important. A critical mind that judges and assesses every single thing in our lives silenced, resentments let go of, and the good news, the vision and freedom that God has fulfilled in our hearing, not in our believing, not in our acting, not fulfilled in our striving, just fulfilled in our hearing is happening today. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May it be so. Amen. So this is the good news, that today this has been fulfilled in our hearing. That Jesus has come to proclaim good news to the poor, to the poor in possessions, to the poor in spirit, to the poor who just don't know where to turn. To give sight to the blind, both actual sight and also insight. To bring the dead year of the Lord's favor upon us so that we may be filled and go forth for the sake of the world. And we are filled. So I'm going to let you have some music a time to reflect on what is being fulfilled today in your hearing, and then we will pray for ourselves and our, for our world. And so I'm going to put on a recording of Pat Butler, our church organist on the piano this time, playing the hymn, Dona Nobis Pacem, Latin for Grant Us Peace. And if you know this hymn, you know that those words are repeated over and over and over again. And so may you repeat them over and over again, a musical prayer for our times, and then we will pray for ourselves and for our world.
Grant us peace. May this be forever our prayer to our God, to the God who made us, who loves us, who has lived among us, and who redeems us. And so now, with the trust that we are God's beloved children, let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we pray this day for ourselves and for our world. There are so many places and so many times when we are captives. We pray for those who are imprisoned, both justly and unjustly, that they may discover the freedom of heart and mind that can come even when the body is held in prison. We pray for those who are imprisoned by the many things that limit the human spirit, imprisoned by doubt, imprisoned by discouragement, imprisoned by depression, imprisoned by poverty, imprisoned in so many ways. Oh God, we pray for the times that we find ourselves captives of our own dark thoughts, of our own dark times, of our own belief that things will never change, of our own despair. And we offer it up to you and ask that you will bless even those dark times so that we may walk forward into the light because you are the one who frees the captive. Jesus proclaimed that good news would be proclaimed to the poor. And Jesus has also charged us, his followers, to do that work. And so we ask your blessing not only on the money that we give and the food and the clothing that we collect for people who are poor, for the housing and shelter that we provide for those who are homeless, but we also ask that you help us to see that these are our brothers and our sisters, that these are your children just as much as we are, that we are no better or worse than they, but at our good fortune, we may offer something to them. Because in doing that, we will find our spirits lifted up. We will find that we are no longer impoverished of spirit. We will discover that there is much that the poor have to teach us about what it is to rely on you, O oh God. And most importantly of all, we will discover that when all of us are lifted up, then all your people can live together in peace. We pray for the places in this world where there is no peace the places that are ravaged by war, by natural disaster, the places where there is unrest, the places where your people are in danger, the places where people struggle in their homes, in their hearts, in their families. Oh God, it is easy to pray, grant us peace, but sometimes it is much harder to find that peace. And so we pray that your peace will come into our hearts, our minds, our lives, and come out from those places into our world. Show us how to be agents of your peace and how to live in ways that are peaceful no matter what circumstances surround us. Jesus also came to proclaim that this is the year of your favor. Oh God, we had many hopes for 2021 because 2020 seemed so hard with the pandemic. And yet we know that there are hard times ahead. What does it mean that this is the year of your favor, oh God? Help us to see that it is not just that our lives will become easier, but also that the meaning of our lives will become more apparent. As we pray for the sick, as we care for the sick, as we seek to overcome the pandemic and other illnesses from which our, your people suffer, as we hope to spread the vaccine just as freely as the disease itself has spread, open up our hearts and minds to the many other ways that this may be the year of your favor, that we may learn lessons from these times of hardship that we will take forward into better days, that we will learn that we are all equal sometimes in disaster, that there are no favorites in the world of pandemic, but that we are also all in this together and that together we can find solutions. Show us the preciousness of each person that we meet. Help us to be thankful for their lives and for the life that we have in this beautiful world. And when we fall short, O oh God, when we do not love nearly enough, forgive us and return us to the light of your love. We pray all these things and so many more in the name of Jesus, who taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope you'll join me again on Sunday morning at 1030 
on Facebook Live or on the northcongregationalchurch.org website as we think about Jesus' call for us to become fishers for people and what that might mean in our own time. In the meantime, I hope that the God of the universe, the God of all creation, the God who made us, who loves us, who has lived as one of us, and who redeems us, will grant you peace. Amen. And may God be with us till we meet again.